Okay, good evening to everyone. About seven years ago, I gave a lecture about the crisis in Israel, for those of you who remember. It was intended to give us an overview as to what is going on in the world, for us to become familiar with what is happening in Eretz Israel, what is happening in the United States of America, where are we headed, what needs to be done, what is wrong. Many things have happened ever since, including September 11. What I decided to do tonight is a lecture about what is next, what we, sh we should be anticipating, and uh, in some ways, I'd like to say that we're living in a very exciting time because we're getting very close to Mashiach. On the other hand, what you're about to hear are some very terrifying things that are about to happen. So you may have to decide yourself if this is really exciting or not. And this is actually a question that was pondered by our rabbis in the past. Some rabbis express themselves that they don't want to be around these times. There are very troubling times, difficult times, difficult times for Am Yisrael, and a difficult time for the entire world. We have a tradition that after 120, when a Jew goes up to Shemaim, they will ask him, Tzipita li Shua, did you look forward to the redemption? And what's interesting about this question is that they ask us Tzipita and not Chikita. What's the difference between Tzipita and Chikita? Chikita means to wait. We're all waiting. We're all waiting for major change to happen. We're all waiting for things to become better. But the word Tzipita means to look forward. There's a big difference between somebody who actually looks forward and somebody who's just waiting. I know many of you are looking forward to receive a refund from the IRS. <laughs> looking forward to something good. There's a big difference between looking forward and waiting. And upstairs they will ask us, did you really look forward to the Mashiach, to the Geulah, to the redemption? And why look forward? Because when you look forward towards something, it shows that you care about it. It shows that you have an interest in it. And more important than all, it shows that you're focused on the real purpose of life and the real mission of humanity, to bring about the kingdom of Hashem in this world. Not everyone is unfortunately focused on this. And that is what they will ask us upstairs, did you do so? What's puzzling about the question is that upstairs they know everything. Why do they have to interview us? Why do they have to interrogate us? Why do they have to ask us questions? They know the truth. But the greatest embarrassment of all when we head upstairs after 120 is when they will show us, do you know, had you believed in this, had you looked forward towards this, your entire life would have been different. You wouldn't have had so many worries. You wouldn't have bothered yourself with all the vanities. You would have focused and concentrated and spent most of your valuable time on the real purpose. Your life would have looked very different. You perhaps would not have had so many troubles. You perhaps would have had a healthier, longer life. This particular question, therefore, Tzipita Yeshua, is a very important question for every Jew to ponder at all times. Is he really looking forward? Is this meaningful to him? The reason why I decided to talk about this topic right now, looking forward to Mashiach, is because I just came back from Eretz Israel, And what was different about this trip is that there happens to be a consensus this time, haskama melea, a consensus amongst all, everyone, all the rabbis, the mekubalim, that we are at the threshold of Mashiach. Rabbis always spoke about Mashiach, always encouraged us not to give up hope, he's going to be coming. 
but that there should be a consensus that things are heating up, that we're going to actually be hearing something very soon, perhaps at the end of this year, a year of Shemitah, a sabbatical year, that everybody would be in agreement that something incredible is about to happen, some major changes in the world are about to occur. For everyone to be in agreement was something new to me. And since there's a great urgency that one prepare himself properly towards the redemption, I decided to share with you as much as possible what needs to be done, what should we be expecting. It is true that the prophets speak at length about what is going to happen. There are many nevuot, prophecies about the end of days. But as the Ramba makes it very clear, many of those details that have been documented will not be understood by us until it gets closer and closer. Daniel himself, his entire prophecy is a mystery. It's hatum v'satum, it's sealed. He himself said so. Except as we get closer, we will understand, we will have a better idea what is about to happen. One of the things that is about to happen is there is going to be a tremendous birur. A birur means a refinement, a filtering process where the good will be separated from the bad. For those of you who may have a difficult time understanding some Kabbalistic concepts, I'll try to simplify them. But in talking about good and bad, we need to touch a little bit on the Kabbalah. This world is an imperfect world. Ever since, from creation, Hashem made it so. And when the world is in an imperfect state, it means that the human being can rebel against the Almighty. He can do the wrong things. He can go against the wishes of Hashem. That is part of our free will. That is the way it was intended. And that is exactly what is insinuated in the story of Chet Adam Arishon when Adam and Chava sinned and rebelled against Hashem pretty much on the very first day. What that means, what that story is supposed to remind us is that this will be the Hitmonedut, this will be the challenge this will be the struggle for all humanity forever until Mashiach comes. We will always struggle between doing the right and doing that which is not right. Thinking of ourselves or actually doing what Hashem wants us to do. This is part of an imperfect world. Until Avraham Avinu came about, when Avraham Avinu came to the scene, he's the one that discovered there is a boss, there's something that he wants of us, we should believe only in Him, and we should do what is right and just. That was the message of Abraham Avinu to his generation, and the Jewish people came out from Abraham Avinu. And it is we who received upon us that great responsibility and mission to disseminate to the entire world, Shashem Echad, Hashem is one, and that He expects us to follow a certain path to comply with his commandments, but unfortunately, we failed. We did not always do a good job. And that is why, ultimately, the one who has to clean up the mess, to repair the world, to bring about its perfection, will be Mashiach. Mashiach, or the Anointed One, that is really his job. His job is to redeem us, of course, to bring us back to the land of Israel, to rebuild the Bet HaMikdash, amongst other things. But the reality is that when he comes, the world will be perfected. The world will come to a perfect state, which is really the original blueprint of what Hashem had in mind, that this world should be a perfect, a good world, a paradise. And that will be the case after Mashiach comes, after the dead will rise, when everything will be just right. There will be no Yetzerara, there will be no evil inclination, to do that which is opposed to the will of Hashem. But in the meantime, what we have is an irbuvia, as the Kabbalah would de describe it. An irbuvia means a mixture of the evil and the good, the evil forces and the good forces, all created by Hashem to allow for free will. And they coexist, even though they don't get along. They coexist. Each one is opposed to each other. And it is up to us to choose between them. 
Unfortunately, for those of you who have read history, you can tell that not only us, but the entire world, we failed. We chose many times to join the forces of evil. That is why there are so many wars, so much slaughter, so much evil going around. Till this very day, we think we live in a more civilized world where there's democracy, etc. Even in the most democratic state as this country, how much corruption there is, how much pornography, how much selfishness. That's all evil. That all belongs to the evil. That is not exactly compatible with the will of Hashem. And therefore, right before Mashiach comes, there's going to be a birur. A birur means a separation, a filtering between the good and the evil. They can no longer continue to be together. They had their time of being together, but the time is finally coming to an end where evil will cease to exist. And in order to bring about this end, Hashem brings a process of birur, where He will filter out those who stayed with the evil, those who pursued the evil, from those who did not. And Zechariah Navi says very clearly that when that happens, two-thirds of the world will disappear. Very clear words. Those are not enigmatic words. Those are not difficult words to understand. If you read the Pesukim, it says very clearly, two-thirds will be gone and one-third will remain. And even from the one-third that will remain, they will be purified and they will be further refined to bring about a complete refinement. What we are really interested to know, however, is what will be the fate of the Jewish people much more than what will be the fate of the non-Jewish world. Amongst us, there is a group called the Erev Rav. The Erev Rav, for those of you who have never heard the term, describes the multitudes of individuals who joined us when we left Egypt. They converted, they saw that the Jewish people were leaving, were becoming free, they wanted to join and convert and be part of the Jewish nation. Moshe basically accepted them, even though Hashem says, they're not really good for you. Their source is evil. What does it mean their source is evil? Some people are holier than others, some people are better than others. Yes, the Kabbalah explains that at the level of the soul, there are some souls that are more divine. And when a soul is more divine, it is automatically attracted to do the right thing, the positive thing. And that is why you have some converts, some non-Jewish souls, that somehow automatically are attracted and feel very close to the Jews. And there are various explanations as to why they choose to convert and why they're attracted. But one of them, Kabbalistically, is that there is some divinity in their soul which pulls them in the direction of doing that which is divine, doing that which is pure and good. And there are some souls that are from the Sitra Hara, from the other camp, from the other side, from the impure side, created as well. Nonetheless, because they lack that divinity in them, they're not so interested. The Erev Rav, even though they joined us, they became part of the Jewish people, they did not have that much of an interest to do the will of Hashem, to do the mitzvot. And they have been causing us tremendous problems, tremendous heartaches throughout history. Ever since the Cheta Egel, which we will be reading this week's parasha, Parashat Kitisa, the golden calf is worshipped. How could the golden calf be worshipped so soon after receiving the Torah, after declaring Naseh Ishma? We were so sincere and so believing but the rabbis tell us, the commentaries explain, it's not the Jews who started it, it's the Erev Rav. They were immersed in witchcraft. They were exposed to the impure and evil forces in Egypt. They were familiar with it. They still had the familiarity, the memory of those forces. And they immediately, for reasons that we don't have the time to get into right now, they decided to make this golden calf. Well... Had it been just them, of course, 
Hashem would not have been so upset at us. But they started it and we followed. And throughout history, they have been always the biggest troublemakers of all. And the prophet clearly points to them when he says, that those who will cause you the greatest source of trouble will be from amongst you, Jews like yourself. But even though they're Jews biologically because their mothers are Jewish, their soul is not completely Jewish. It's not completely pure. It is a soul from the Erev Rav. It is a soul that belongs to the other camp. And because of that, they're not interested. They're not interested in being Jewish. They don't have the same attachment to Eretz Israel as an ordinary Jew does. And the rabbis tell us, we will be able to identify them as soon as we get close to Mashiach's time, because at that time there will be a filtering process. And through that filtering process, we will know, Mila Shem Elai, who is in Hashem's camp and who is in the other camp. Who cares about the Torah? Who cares about the Beit HaMikdash? Who cares about Yerushalayim? And who couldn't care less and would easily give it away to the Arabs? And for those of you who follow the news, which I don't necessarily encourage, but in case you do anyway, you will find that there are some who couldn't care less about Yerushalayim. And we will find out who they are when this filtering process begins when they start talking about giving away Yerushalayim, which was predicted by the prophets will happen, then you will know who's on which side. These, this gang, I'd like to call them, of Erev Rav, they were called the Biryonim in the Second Temple era. Biryonim. Biryonim means strong fellows, who tried to impose their will on the majority. They were very strong, mafia, olam atachton as we call them in Hebrew. And they, through their tactics, somehow were able to force the rabbis, the leaders of the generation, to fight the Romans, to not give in. Don't cede to them Yerushalayim. Don't give in, fight them, even though the rabbis knew clearly through Ruach HaKodesh that there was no reason to fight. There was no reason to oppose the Romans. This was a lost battle. The Bet HaMikdash is about to be destroyed. Am Yisrael is about to go to the diaspora. Try to save as many Jewish souls as possible. Try to safeguard what you have. Don't allow everything to be destroyed. So they contributed very, very much to the destruction destruction of the second temple. For those of you who know a little bit about reincarnation, Gilgul Neshamot, it says very clearly in the Zohar that many Neshamot will come back right before Mashiach comes. We will have the Neshamot of Dora Mabul and Dora Palaga, souls that lived during the time of the flood and during the time when the Tower of Babel was built. In other words, souls that were not too good, souls that were removed from this world. Nevertheless, they come back. They come back for some tikkun, something that Hashem has in mind for them. And so will some of the souls of the Erev Rav, of the Biryonim, come back and live with us at the time of Mashiach. The Zohar says something incredible. You want to know who they are? They will be the leaders, the prime ministers, etc., etc. There's no need to mention names because who are we to, to say clearly who is who? But the Zohar gives us more or less an idea. You want to know where they are, who they are? They will be the leaders and some of them will be religious Jews as well. Just because somebody has a beard does not mean that he's for sure not from the Erev Rav. Just because somebody wears a kippah, you don't know what's really going on, going on in his heart. He could be disguising himself. He could be corrupt on the inside with a facade that looks great and nice. They're called hypocrites in English. And the hypocrites are from the Erev Rav. And unfortunately, they will be our leaders before Mashiach comes. 
And the only way they're going to stop being leaders is when Mashiach takes the leadership from them. So one of the things that we can expect very, very soon, hopefully, sooner than later, is that they will no longer be in power. Because they're leading the Jews astray. I'm not saying every one of them, but a lot of them are leading the Jews astray. The entire establishment of their movement, of the Erev Rav, in Israel, was to take Jews away from the Torah and Mitzvot. They did that to the Yemenite Jews. They did that to many Moroccan and North African Jews. They took away a beautiful, precious tradition that was with them for close to 2,000 years. And almost overnight, they took it away from them. They robbed them from that which was so special that their parents and grandparents were willing to die for. This is not Jewish. What is this? This is something that belongs to the other camp. They don't have a Jewish soul. They may be biologically Jewish, but they're definitely not. They don't have a Jewish soul. They're called the Erev Rav. This is a force that we have to contend with. However, this is a force that we have to be very wary of. And many, many rabbis in the past generation made us aware, be careful with them. They may appear nice to you, but they have a completely different agenda than you do. And it's hard to believe that another Jew would have a completely different agenda than we do. But that's a fact of life. That is why you have 120 parties in the Knesset. Each one has his own agenda. Except for the agenda of Hashem. Nobody is interested in that. What he has in mind, what he expects of us, nobody really cares. But in the very end, as I said before, there will be a filtering process and those who are evil, the evil is attracted to the evil and the good will be attracted to the good and we will be able to tell who is on which side. Daniel speaks about the birur, as he says, Itbareru vit labenu vit sarfu rabim. Yechezkel speaks about the birur, the, the filtering process, Uvaroti mikem hamordim imbi. I will remove from you, from amongst you, those who rebelled against me. All of this will happen prior to Mashiach's coming. Why does it have to really happen now? Rabbis tell us that when Mashiach comes, all the good that was promised to us through the prophets, we will get the tremendous good that is awaiting for us, the reward for the fulfillment of the mitzvot. So much good is about to surface. The gates of holiness are about to open up completely. And when all of that happens, the truth will come out. In order for the truth to come out, everything which is a lie, everything which is false, which is evil, has to be removed. And it will begin to peel away in the same way that we peel an orange. Before we get to the fruit, we have to remove the peel. The peel is something we throw away. In other words, the sheker, that which is false, needs to be exposed. Hashem will therefore expose them. And when that happens, everybody will know, of course, what the truth is. Today, not everybody is certain. Some people believe in evolution, in a big bang, in all sorts of things. It's not clear to them. The truth is lacking, as the rabbis tell us, I met the NA did it. Nobody knows who, the tru who the, who's, has the truth, what is the truth. Everybody claims to know the truth. Everybody claims to know what is right. But when the sheker becomes exposed, everybody will know. Now, how does that happen? How will the sheker, how will the falsehood become exposed? It can happen in several ways. Rabbis tell us that right before Mashiach comes, there will be some tremendous natural disasters that will occur. Earthquakes, floods, wars. And why do these things happen in general? They don't happen by chance. 
Earthquakes, the rabbis tell us, happen for either one or two reasons. Earthquakes happen, major earthquakes, because Hashem sees how the world is built up, how beautiful everything looks. And He says, everything is built up except for my home, except for the Beta Migdash, which still is in ruins. And that is when the, sh earth, when the earth begins to shake. Hashem is upset that his Beta Migdash is not built yet. Another reason why there are major earthquakes, the rabbis tell us, is because of homosexuality. And that is another reason why we have earthquakes. Floods, floods have to do with water. Water has to do with purity. To purify all the impurities of idol worshipping in Asia, for example. It's not a coincidence that the tsunami hit there because of all the idols there, the paganism, plus prostitution, znut, zima. The water is intended to clean up all of that. So the Kabbalah is very explicit that right before Mashiach comes, the oceans of the world will rise and many countries will be underwater. There will be major phenomena natural disasters. But what you will see soon, what I will show you very soon, is a natural phenomena that hasn't occurred yet. Not in recent human history. Something completely different, something incredible and frightening. For what purpose? To make sure that nobody says, oh, we live in California, so we have the San Andreas Fault run through it, and that is why we have earthquakes. Um, we live in a, in a certain part of the world, like in Netherlands. If you live in the Netherlands, Netherlands is low. Well, that's why they may have floods. So in order for no one to ever say that this is natural, that this is normal, Hashem wants to prove His point. He wants to make His presence known. Therefore, he will bring about some major natural disasters that nobody will deny that it's from him. And when that occurs, basically, the truth will come out. Shashem echad echad, that he's always been around. Nobody will be able to deny that. That is why it will be necessary to bring about these natural disasters that are not common, that are not normal, that there's no explanation for them. The big question, of course, is when all this begins to happen, how will we survive? We live in this world as well. We live all over the world. The Jewish people are everywhere. And if these things begin to happen, what can we do to protect ourselves? Well, I said before that there will be a filtering process. And in the filtering process, automatically those who are not involved in the camp of evil will be saved, will be protected. Nevertheless, there are many who have not made up their minds yet. And they're in between. And the Chafetz Chaim says something incredible. He says, Mashiach will come in a generation that is completely righteous or completely evil. That is the quote of the rabbi. So the question is, how could that be? There are many who are, have both, who are a mixture of good and evil. So the Chafetz Chaim says, the real meaning behind that message is that today, yes, there are those who may be a mixture. But when Mashiach comes, people are going to have to make a decision. To who do they belong? They will either be on the righteous camp or on the opposing camp. There will be no free lunches. We will have to make a decision. And that decision will be made soon because there's no time left. And Hashem will give us a chance. And before it begins to happen, something will awaken people. Either they will be awakened by a class or something else will awaken them 
According to the Kabbalah, those who've had a special father or grandfather, or those who performed some special good deed, they will have the zechut, the merit, to return on their own. Somehow they will feel an attraction. Somehow they will feel that they're being awakened to change their ways. And once, of course, a Jew embarks on changing his ways, we call that teshuvah. He's returning to the Almighty. There are those, however, that are asleep, and they're going to need to be awakened. And what's going to wake them up will be major wars. But not just wars. There's something else that many of us are not realizing is about to happen. I mentioned the fact that very soon the Shekel will be exposed. The truth will come out. What will happen at that time also is that all the empires that we knew, those who were very powerful, will collapse. Anything that has anything to do with Shekel will collapse. Therefore, there will be a tremendous collapse in the economy. And some are wondering if the weakening of the dollar has anything to do with it. Perhaps. And the reason why that may be so is because even though we live in this country and we're thankful for everything that this country has done for us so we can live as Jews, nevertheless, I think all of you will agree with me, this country is not perfect. There are many, many problems today in this country. If the fathers of the Constitution would be able to see what is going on, they would be very, very upset and disappointed. This is not what they had in mind. Obviously, the generation is deteriorating spiritually all over the world. But the United States of America is a superpower. And what will happen to this superpower? Turn to Jacob's dream. Jacob, Yaakov Avinu, has a halom. He sees a ladder, angels going up, coming down. And who are those angels? The various ministers of the nations, the world powers to be. And he sees them going up, and after a while they come down. And you know what that means? That means all these powers, these great powers, will eventually come down. They don't last forever. They're not pure. But then he sees the last minister, the minister of Edom, the Roman Empire, going up and it's not coming down. And he's afraid. What does this mean? Edom, the Roman Empire who destroyed the Second Temple, who gave the Jews so, many, so much trouble, who has been the greatest anti-Semites of all, who has persecuted us almost in every generation, in every country. They're going to be around for a long time? Yes. For a long time, but not forever. As the Prophet says, even if you rise high, I will bring you down from there. Even if you go to space, even if you place yourself on the highest positions, from there I will bring you down. In other words, they will not last forever. They've been around since 1776, and that's not too long. And we don't know exactly how much more time is left but they're not going to be around forever. And for those of you who are thinking the Chinese are going to take over, I don't think so. Even though it's true that they're becoming a major economical power today, but there are no more powers. The next one is Mashiach. The next one is Hashem will rule. His kingdom will be in power. Nothing else will be. Everything else will be crashing down. Everything else will fall apart. And the reason for that is because it's all sheker. It's all false. It's not exactly what Hashem had in mind. And when he begins the filtering system, that is exactly what's going to happen. So many of the wars that we're about to see is basically a battle between the good forces and the evil forces. And in the midst of all of this, a lot of people will be frightened and the frightening will be for their benefit, to awaken them and to give them a final chance. They will have to realize not to put their trust anymore in the golden calf, not to worship materialism,
Because that is the greatest obstacle in the service of Hashem. Those who are very attached to a materialistic kind of life. And this includes, unfortunately, observant Jews as well. How could you tell if somebody is attached to materialism? Well, basically ask him, go over to him, and see what he's interested the most. Is he praying for Malchut Shamayim, for the kingdom of Hashem to rule? Is he looking forward for Mashiach? Does he want the Bet Hamidash to be restored? What is he crying about? Is he crying about that he doesn't have a home, that he has such a high interest rate? I mean, what, what are the things that are bothering him? Or is he crying that, that he's not strong enough in Emunah, in his faith, and he wants to become closer, that he wished he could be closer to Hashem? What bothers him? When you speak to a Jew and you find out what bothers him, you can know a lot about him, what's on his mind. And unfortunately, on many Jews' mind is not Mashiach, not the Bet HaMikdash, not Malchut Shamaim, not Kavod Shamaim. And that is sad, very, very sad. And the greatest accusation, of course, will be against those who are observant, who know more and should know better. That they should not put such a great emphasis on the vanities and materialistic things in life. This is what's causing them to distance themselves from the ultimate tachlit, from the ultimate purpose. Materialism causes one to become indifferent and not sensitive to that which is spiritual in nature. Spirituality and materialism are totally different, totally opposite. And if one is involved very much in a materialistic lifestyle, then how could you expect of him to be sensitive? How could you expect of him to cry when he prays and asks Hashem, to get closer to him. He may cry because uh, obviously he, he'd like to get a, get a job, he'd like to make some money, but for him to really cry that he wants to be closer to Hashem, not necessarily, he's not sensitive enough. He's so materialistic and therefore so detached from his real mission in life. But at some point that has to come to an end. And that is why very, very soon things will become more and more obvious who's in charge, who's been in charge all along, and what is about to happen. I saw something incredible in the name of the Chafetz Chaim. The Chafetz Chaim, one time, in the morning, before he said blessing, Shalom Asani Goy, we make that blessing every day that we're thankful to Hashem for not having made us a Gentile, but for allowing us, for giving us the opportunity to serve Him, to fulfill His commandments, to be a part of the Jewish nation with this very unique mission. Don't misunderstand me, there is a lot of good non Jews as well. We don't discriminate by saying that. We're just very, very happy and proud of the opportunity. And as I've explained in the past, we don't say Shasani Yehudi. Thank you, Hashem, for making me Jewish. Because whether one is Jewish or not will depend on his conduct. How he behaves himself throughout life, whether he fulfills God's commandment or not. When one is born, when a baby is born, he's cute. He's circumcised whether he wants it or not. But what may end up with this child, whether he turns to be a tzaddik or a monster, only time will tell. One can therefore not say shasani Yehudi. It's not possible to know that until they bury him, then we can speak about whether he was Jewish or not. What we can say is shelo asani goy. Thank you Hashem for not making me a Gentile. Uh, I'm very happy that I've been given the opportunity to do that, that which is right. The Chafetz Chaim one day was seen waiting for 10 minutes before he made this blessing. Somebody went over to him. I think it was Rav Khan Wasserman, somebody else, one of his close students. Why did you take your time before making this blessing today? I really wanted to be sure that there's nothing goy about me. 
Many Jews, unfortunately, have assimilated to the ways of the Goyim in their conduct, in the way they dress, in adapting many of the customs, assimilating the culture of the non-Jewish world. And they have become like Goyim. Could they really say, Shelo Asani Goy? They really have to ask themselves that question. And that is exactly what will be the fact before Mashiach comes, there will be many Jews that will be so assimilated that they will be more like Goim, unfortunately. Nevertheless, they will be given a chance. And I've never done this before. I rarely talk about it, but I'm going to make an exception now. The reason I'm going to make an exception now is because of the urgency of the matter that we may not have too many opportunities more to talk about what is yet to happen, and we want to be fair to everyone. So I will make an exception this time and call out to my brothers and sisters in the conservative and reform movement that yes, up until now, for the past 150 years, that we have not mingled together It was because it was dangerous for us to mingle together. In the past 150 years, because of your leadership, not because of you, but because of the leadership who was led astray, in some ways you were led to believe that it is okay to dilute Judaism or to reinvent it and to cut away what was once the tradition for the entire Jewish people. We have no problem with the members of any movement out there. We, of course, are very upset at their leadership because the leaderships are really the ones to blame. They have it within their power to influence people, to teach people, and they have been misguiding them. Therefore, I want to use this opportunity to let all those members of those movements know that we love them very much and we care about them. And we would really love to, for all of us to be one nation without any divisions whatsoever. I therefore ask them to do themselves a favor to reevaluate who they are. Im Hashem Elokim, if God is the true God, then you should join Him. And if not, then go and become something else. Ad matay atem poschim l'shteh seipim, as Eliyahu Navi called out to the Jews in his generation, till when will you try to ride on both camps? Call yourself Jewish? but not act as a Jew and not practice Judaism. It is not fair and it is not right to call all these other brands of Judaism other brands of Judaism because they're not Judaism. True authentic Judaism is what is written in the Torah. The Torah clearly states that it will never change. It will always be the same. And if anybody ever tells you that the rules have changed, you know he's a false prophet. You know that he's misleading you. You know that he's wrong and he will not succeed. So this is perhaps the last opportunity, the last chance that anybody really has very soon, and I really mean it very, very soon, there will not be any more chance to do teshuvah. Teshuvah means to repent, to repent on your own, to come back to Hashem, and once the curtain comes up and the, the truth is revealed and that which is Sheker is exposed, it will be too late to make any changes. And that is exactly what is about to happen. But we still have time to make the change. What changes need to be made? I very much would like to emphasize that the greatest and most important changes that need to be made are the way we see each other 
and the lack of unity amongst the Jews, the lack of achdut. Some people look down at Sephardim, Ashkenazim, Yemenites, Moroccans, whatever it is. There should be no segregation and no division, no discrimination whatsoever. But it, there is. It exists in some school systems. I have heard it, seen it, that some people do not want to accept a member of another group. That is what brought about the destruction of the Second Temple, baseless hatred, sinat chinam. And in order for us to rebuild the Bet HaMikdash, we have to eliminate that. That cannot continue to exist. What breeds this baseless hatred is the Shonara, when people talk about each other. When they talk in a negative way, in a demeaning way, in a belittling way. That's La Shonara. And it happens in our dining room tables on Shabbat. Parents talk amongst themselves, the children overhear it, and that is how we perpetuate this hatred. Just look at the Arabs. How does an Arab hate a Jew? He hears it from his parents, who heard it from their parents. Or they heard it in, in the mosque. And that is how they pick up the hatred. It's perpetuated forever. There's no stop. I don't want to compare ourselves to them, but that is exactly what happens in our homes. If we look down at other Jews, if we speak negatively about some Jews, that is the impression the children will have. and The problem never ceases to exist. In order to deal with this cancer of Lashon Hara, the best cure, I find, from my experience, is to do the opposite. Is to speak good, to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Speak good about every Jew, how, how he's so precious. We're all children of Hashem. We all should care about each other. We all should want to help each other. So one way of dealing with this Lashon Ara problem is by speaking only good and only positively about everyone. And if we don't have anything positive to say about them, then give him the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps he doesn't know. Perhaps he wasn't taught. Perhaps he grew up in a kibbutz where he was deprived of Judaism. And how should he know? And that is true about anything. Husband and wife relationships too. Instead of being upset at your spouse, perhaps give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they didn't realize it. Maybe they forgot. Maybe they made a mistake. There's so many ways to give someone the benefit of the doubt instead of hating them and being upset at them. And it's not a coincidence that in this generation there are so many divorces for similar reasons and similar problems that exist amongst us, the Jewish people. Sinat chinam, lashonara. There's a hatred, a selfishness. Therefore, the same cure for one's home is the cure for dealing with the problem of Sinat Hinam in Am Yisrael. Being tolerant of everyone, giving everyone the benefit of the doubt. What is going to happen next? I mentioned earlier that one of the ways of bringing about the collapse of a nation is by bringing about the collapse of its economy. Another way is by sending it to war. A nation can disappear, a nation can lose its glory from war. That is how it happened in the past. The Babylonians, the Persians, the Romans were never destroyed because the Romans split up into many countries. Who is Rome today? Europe and the United States. Rabbis tell us that before Mashiach comes, there will be many wars. And these wars will eventually bring about the collapse of Edom. Not only the economy will be in ruins, but many people will lose their life as a result of this war. Do you have any idea how many people lost their life in World War II? People know 6 million Jews. Do you know how many Russians? I think 20 million. 
How many Americans? I don't want to even tell you how many Germans. I think 50 million people is the estimate of how many died in World War II. How about World War I? The Chafetz Chaim said very, very clearly, after World War I finished, you see this war? This will be child's play compared to another world that will come a few years from now. He meant World War II. And you know this World War II that will be? That will be child's play compared to a third war that will occur later on. And that third world war, or major war, will be at Halta de Geula. That will be the beginning of the redemption when that occurs. Even though that is not clear to us how it will begin, the Zohar and the Midrashim say that there will be several wars. Some wars will be between Ishmael and Edom, between the Muslims and the Christians. That sounds familiar. We've had the Crusades several times. These guys have been fighting each other for a long time. And they will have major battles at the end. Muslims against Christians. And this is already happening right now through terrorism or with America going to Iraq. I heard something recently in the name of the Chazonish. Chazonish Zechet Tzadik Levracha said, America, because America is Malchut Chesed, they've been so kind in helping so many countries with free food, even though I'm sure they had some interest in doing that. But nevertheless, they've been kind and charitable. He says, because of that, there will never be a war on America's territory. All the wars that they will fight, and they will fight, will be outside their country. That does not mean to say that nothing will happen here. Unfortunately, some things are going to happen in this country too. Because what is about to happen will happen all over the world, except for Eretz Israel. As the Navi says, in the mountain of Zion there will be refuge, that will be the safest place on earth. You may ask me, does that mean you're, you're leaving soon? The answer is yes. I don't have my ticket yet. But soon, that will be the safest place. I still need to be here because I need to speak to you. But soon, yes, that will be the safest place on earth. Everywhere else in the world, there will be trouble. All kinds of trouble. And what will happen in the midst of all this trouble, in all these wars and battles between Yishmael and Edom, between Muslims and Christians? There will be one Muslim nation that will stir up major trouble and chaos all over the world. Iran. Now, 30 years ago, or maybe a little bit more, I mentioned this to someone. You know what? Those Iranians are going to be big troublemakers in the future. So he says, what are you talking about? You know that Israel has good relationship, a good relationship with the Shah. There are two flights a week from Tel Aviv to Tehran. And for those of you who lived in Iran back then, you know that there was a very good relationship. And I said, well, that may be so, but something is going to have to happen. And remember, this is a little over 30 years ago. I'm young. I'm not going to tell you how old I was. But I was young. And I was telling them. And how did I know this? Because the Midrash says so very clearly. That right before Mashiach comes, there will be a Persian king, apparently a tyrant, who will cause a lot of havoc in the world. It will begin by him invading an Arab nation. After which the Arab nation will consult with Edom, with Europe. After which there will be major wars. What kind of war will there be? The Kabbalists that I've just met and heard from are saying there will be some nuclear war. There will be some nuclear exchange some at least. And that will frighten who? 
Forget the world. Forget South Korea being afraid of North Korea. It will frighten us in Israel. And what will that fright do to us? It will make us realize we can't rely on our air force, we can't rely on our army, we can't rely on our prime minister. We forgot we left that a long time ago. Right? We can only rely on our Father in heaven. That will be the last moment before the gates are closed for Teshuvah, that people will awaken, hopefully, and realize that we can only rely on him. This is very scary stuff, because if it's not nuclear, it could easily be biological. And you know why I personally think that biological warfare is a big possibility more than nuclear? Because it's easier. It's not easy to put together a nuclear bomb, even though the instructions are on the internet. But the infrastructure that is needed for it is not easy. Biological warfare is very easy. You just throw a bunch of germs, some deadly germs, that you can carry in your pocket, and you've killed a few thousand people just like that. And that they can easily do. Chaz shalom. But if that is what needs to happen, that is what will happen. To get people scared in this... Part of getting people scared is only to awaken them. That is the purpose of frightening people. But besides scaring people, besides bringing them to do Teshuvah, the reason why these wars will occur, he has a long account with all the goyim. All the blood that they spilled, you think he forgot? We forget. We forget. The only reason we remember the Holocaust is because there are videos, films, and pictures. Otherwise, we'd have forgotten that too. Does anybody here know or remember about Tachvetat, the pogroms of Chemenitsky in the Ukraine and Poland? 300 Jewish communities were wiped out. Wiped out! Destroyed! 300,000 Jews lost their life. What about the Inquisition in Spain, later in Portugal? What about all the millions of Jews who lost their life in the First Temple, Second Temple era throughout our history? You mean there's no accounting, there's no tzedek, there's no justice? Whatever happened to those who caused the trouble, all that brought so much misery over the Jewish people? Yesh cheshbon. There will be nekama, there will be revenge. El nekamot Hashem. He's a God that takes revenge. You mean he's, he's a revengeful God? No, he's not a revengeful God, because all these midot, all these characteristics that we ascribe to him, he does not really have. It's just for us to understand how he conducts himself in this world that we use these terms. When Hashem takes nekama, it's to even things out. Sheyet tzedek. Atzur tamim paolo, we say in Hazinu. He's a God who's just, who's complete. We don't see it today. We see a lot of unfairness. We see evil rule. Not when Mashiach comes. Not before right before Mashiach comes, when it will become obvious that he's in charge, there will be tzedek, there will be nekama. And all those goyim who brought about so much pain and suffering on the Jewish people will be punished. Every square inch of Europe is drenched with Jewish blood. So I'm not envious of anybody living in Europe at this time. That is not a good place to be. Just about everywhere in Europe where Jews lived, they were either tortured, killed, or expelled. You may be wondering why Hashem wants to destroy His world, why so much destruction, so much nuclear bombs, and so forth. The Maral Miprak says that before something new is built, you have to demolish that which was old, especially that which was impure. The Zohar says when the Jewish people entered Eretz Israel and took over the homes of the Kna'anim, who were pagan, they, all of a sudden they saw tzara'at, they saw leprosy on the walls. One of the benefits of that leprosy was intended for them to destroy the wall, destroy the house that was built through impurity and rebuild the home in The world, a great part of it, will be destroyed because of the impurity. 
before a new world is built, the old has to be destroyed. And that destruction will come about in various ways. One, through the floods. The floods, as I mentioned earlier, is a force of purity, of cleansing, that will need to happen in this world before Mashiach comes. I want to share with you an incredible dream or vision that a woman had recently. But I want to tell you a little bit about this woman. This woman's name is Saada. She has uh, done teshuva, become a very righteous and observant woman. She saw the Twin Towers collapsing before they happened. She's had incredible visions that has obviously convinced her to become more observant and return to Hashem. And recently, she had another vision about what is going to happen soon. And the reason why I'm, I'm including her dream and vision in this lecture is because the prophet Yoel says that right before Mashiach comes, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will allow many to have prophetic visions about what is about to happen. Many children, especially, will become aware of certain things. And it is possible that some souls are very special and pure will have the privilege of seeing these visions. Obviously, this film, this short film, probably borrows from some other movie some of the captions and some of the scenes. Nevertheless, it very much illustrates what is going to happen. In that vision, in this little film, you will see what I said earlier, there will be some incredible events that will occur in this world, natural phenomena that has not been seen before in recent human history. And one of those is meteorites coming crashing down to this world and causing tremendous havoc and destruction. So take a look at what she saw, and I will briefly translate what she says, because it's in Hebrew. <laughs> אני אחד אני לא ראשון כמו בכל הפעמים, ואני חולמת שאני שומעת פיצוצים, אבל פיצוצים חזקים שהאוזן לא יכלה לשמוע אותם. בעצם בחלום התעוררתי מהפיצוצים, מהרעש של הפיצוצים, פשוט קמתי והתחלתי לרוץ לכיוון החלום, לראות בעצם איפה בין הפיצוצים האלה, ואני מסתכלת מהחלום. ואני רואה את הדהמתי בתוך החלום, אש יורדת משמיים, הבזקים של אש יוצאת מהשמיים. אם אני יכולה לתאר את זה כמו קרן לייזר, קרנות לייזר שיוצאים מכל הכיוונים ונוגעות בבתים ונוגעות באדמה והכל פשוט מתקורר ואש מכל הכיוונים, קרנות, 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 קרנות של אש. אני פשוט רואה אנשים רצים לכל הכיוונים ואני מבחינה שאותה קרן פוגעת באנשים וכל האור מתקלף להם והם עושים ואפשר להגיד תוך, אם אני יכולה להגיד את זה בזמן, שתי דקות אני מנסות כאן ספור על הרצפה אפשר היה לראות את האדמה, היו בניינים נפולים היה מין מצב כזה של עשן שיוצא מהאדמה. היה בלאגן שאי אפשר להבין אותו בהיגיון, וכל הבלאגן הזה קרה בכזו מהירות, שאני כל החלום הייתי מעמדת ולא הבנתי מה קורה בכלל. וראיתי גם בין לבין אנשים בודדים, שנעמדו, מחובקים, ולא זזים מהמקום ולא מסתכלים, אלא שהפנים שלהם לרצפה והם מחובקים אחד עם השני, והם לא מסתכלים מה שקורה. והם עומדים והקרנות לא נוגעים בהם. אז תוך כדי כל הבלאגן, וכל הרעש של הפיצוצים, וכל החורבן, פתאום שקט. פתאום הכל הפסיק. 
אז אני ככה מסתכלת, ופתאום אני קולטת משהו יורד מהשמיים, אבנים ענקיות, שקופות כמו קרח, בגודל בניינים. ופתאום אני רואה משהו שבהתחלה לא הבנתי מה זה, וזה בהתחלה נראה לי כמו נוצות. בהתחלה נראה לי כמו נוצות שכאילו מתעופפות בשמיים ויורדים לי לכיוון למטה. ואז תוך כדי זה שהם התחילו להתקרב יותר לכיוון האדמה, אני רואה ממש כמו בני אדם, לבנים, לבנים אנשים, נוחתים מהשמיים והם נחתו על האבנים השקופות. ממש הם היו עפים, והם פשוט באו אלינו כדי להציל אותנו ולהסביר לנו מה קרה. Okay, for those of you who didn't understand, but you more or less got an idea from the picture, is that in her vision, she obviously heard and saw all this explosion coming down to the world, people running for their life. Very, very, very scary dream. But in the end, she sees these transparent cubes coming down. and what appear to be angels or humans coming down on these cubes and telling those who still survived, the few who still survived, that the world has been destroyed and you have remained and we have come to show you what to do. This is approximately the vision that she has, which is, by the way, quite compatible with the sources that we have that describe the events leading up to Mashiach, especially Milchemet Gog and Magog, which is the last final war, where there will be Avne El Gavish, as the Prophet says, raining down on the enemy. Avne El Gavish are meteorites. For those who follow the news, you may have heard that some scientists are really scared of that possibility that an asteroid or a comet, meteorites, could come crashing down, could come close to the Earth. And if they do, if they are large enough, they can be very destructive. But anyway, this is something which has not happened yet, and we hope does not happen. But because this is part of the process, we have to be aware. that it may happen. I mentioned to you Milchemet Gog and Magog. The war of Gog and Magog is the last war. It's a final war. It's after the battles and the problems with the Persian king. And that is a war against the Jews alone. That is a war where all the nations will gang up on us. And why will they gang up on us? They will gang up to take away Yerushalayim from us. They will want to settle matters on their own, against our will. And according to our tradition, this will happen after Mashiach ben Yosef has already arrived. There is a Mashiach ben David who rebuilds the temple, who is the king, but there is a leader called Mashiach ben Yosef who will fight Edom. And in the process of him ruling Eretz Yisrael, they will all come against us. And why do they come against us? So the rabbis explain that this will be a way for Hashem to take revenge from them. He will show us and show them that these are the same people, the same nations who've caused you trouble in the past, who are not coming back in a reincarnation. The same leaders of the past, Titus, Nebuchadnezzar, all the names that you remember from our history, those same people will be leaders and presidents of nations who somehow under the leadership of the United Nation, or perhaps the United States, the superpower, will come against Yerushalayim. So we don't have any friends. No, we don't have any friends. And as President de Gaulle said once, nations don't have friends, they have interests. So even though right now America appears to be on our side, it doesn't appear that they will be for too long. Before this happens, however, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will allow those who have not made up their mind yet to make up their mind on which camp they are, as I said earlier. 
And this is a very important part of the Talicha Geula, the redemption process, because we are told that this process will be almost identical to the process in Egypt. What happened in Egypt? When we left Egypt, rabbis tell us four-fifths stayed behind and died by Makat HaChoshech in the plague of darkness. And only one-fifth left, Vahamushim Alu. Only one-fifth left, 20%. So what that means is that not everyone will survive. And as I said earlier, of the entire world's population, two-thirds will disappear. And when we say that, we mean everyone, even amongst us, chaz v'shalom. So if only one-fifth will survive, who will they be? It will be only those who did teshuvah. And in order to do teshuvah, to do proper teshuvah, one really has to cry. One really has to pray. One really has to strengthen his emunah. Chafetz Chaim says that in the generation before Mashiach comes, emunah, just believing God is going to be so difficult that he recommends people to review emuna, 13 principles of emunah, just to be strong in emunah. And as well as working on one's weakness of Lashonara and the like, this is a, a way of doing teshuvah. Everybody knows his weaknesses. Everybody knows what he needs to work on specifically. But these areas that I mentioned, to be connected to Hashem properly, one really has to pray to Him. One really has to cry to Him. That shows sincerity. A lot of people rush through their prayers as though this is something routine and uninteresting. They have therefore no communication with Hashem. They're not connected with Him. When it comes, however, to a TV show, to the Super Bowl, you can bet that they don't want to miss anything. And if they're not going to be around, they'll have it videoed and recorded, sometimes even on Shabbat, so they don't miss anything. Chaz v'shalom of the Super Bowl. They have to see everything. And those who actually see it are enjoying themselves with a beer or with popcorn. This is, this is what brings excitement. This is... This is what is meaningful to them. And that tells you a lot about the person. If that's what he chooses, if that is what he, he values, that is how he spends his time and money, then obviously he's very, very distant from Hashem. Another very, very important mitzvah that unfortunately is looked down at, not valued, is tzitzit. And the rabbis tell us, you want to be protected when Gogo Magog comes, do the following. Do the following and you will be saved. Tasok beTorah milut chasadim. Study Torah and do acts of kindness. Why? Because Torah and acts of kindness build this world. People are involved and immersed in so many destructive things. Things that pull them away from that which is spiritual. It's destructive. Learn Torah, which will give you direction. Do acts of kindness, and you will be saved. I am adding on my own, based on what I've seen, that tzitzit, because it's a mitzvah that people look down at, those who pick it up, those who show they care about it, put it on them all the time, will be offered also tremendous protection. And to prove it to you, I want you to see the following short film about an individual who was involved in a tremendous car accident. His entire body was shattered. Every part of his body was affected. Major operations to reconstruct him. The only part that was intact without even a burn was his chest because he had a tzitzit on that he just decided to put it on a couple hours before he went into the car. An incredible story of an individual who died for 17 minutes, I think, went up to Shamaim, he had what's called a near-death experience, saw himself in front of judges who basically took apart his entire life of what he did right and what he did wrong and was allowed to come back, became a tremendous Baal Teshuvah. But what I'd like you to see is what the Tzitzit did for him. <laughs> These are the nails that they use to reconstruct his body, the screws. 
הקרקינה של מחליפת העצם, אתם רואים, הנה התורמת שלה פנימה, מחליפת העצם העליונה, פתאום זה מחובר כבר מעצמות הרגל, ברוך השם. טלית פשוטה, פיצית פשוטה, מצילה חיים של אדם. כל הגוף שלי התרסק, כף רגל, שני ברכיים, אגן ירחיים, שני ידיים, פרצוף, אבל כל הגוף שלי שלם בלי קביעה. שבועיים לפני, מצווה קציצית, כל צעד ושעל שלה בבית דין של מעלה, מצווה דאורייתא. ויאמר השם, משה לברוך דבר את בני ישראל ואמרת להם, ועשו להם, קציצית על דרכי יהודיהם. מי שאומר לי, תשמע, יש לך סגולה בשבילי. אתה לא ינסו לי, תפתח את התפילה, תפתח את הספר בתורה, תסתכל על הדבר שאנחנו מתנהגים. קמי אחי לטוב. Obviously, this is intended for the men, an incredible protection, even at night, from bad dreams and the like. It only costs $7 if you get the cotton ones. If you get the wool ones, it's a little more expensive. Tremendous protection. People just say, ah, it's too hot. I don't want to put it on. They don't realize that it's just as important, if not more important, than the mezuzah. that they have protecting them in their homes. Tzitzit is so special because when one puts it on and makes a beracha, umekabel al atzmo ol malchut shamayim. He's accepting upon himself the yoke of heaven, yoke of heaven in the same way as when he says the kriyat shma, the shma is selling, declaring that Hashem echad u shmo echad. I therefore encourage those of you who don't have one yet, get yourself one quickly. Tremendous source of protection. I mentioned earlier that one of the battles will be against Yerushalayim. And I mentioned the fact that many Jews will not support Yerushalayim. They will actually join the enemy, the Zohar says. They will join Gog and Magog, our own brothers, and fight with them against us. Yerushalayim is central to Jews. It's always been important to us. And somehow, somehow, this will be a way for us to tell who is our brother and who is not. And the reason for that perhaps is found in Tehillim, where David HaMelech says, Shalu Shlom Yerushalayim. Ask for the peace. Show your love for Yerushalayim. In other words, if you want to connect to the Jews, this is the spot where you can connect. Yerushalayim will remind you of the Bet HaMikdash. And in case you've forgotten, I will allow these Arabs to build a mosque on the Harabayit. Isn't that strange? Harabayit, where the temple stood, could have been desolate ever since the destruction of the temple. Why does God allow the Arabs to build a mosque in a city, in a spot, which is not even mentioned in the Quran? Well, I have various explanations for it. One of them, I'm actually thankful to the Arabs for putting it there, because otherwise we would have the Israeli secular archaeologists digging up the spot. And according to our tradition, the ark and the tablets are underneath. Hashem says, I'm not going to allow these guys to get close to there. And if they ever try to get close, the Arabs are going to make a big scandal. That's one explanation. However, the other explanation is that An Arab mosque. An Arab mosque. And by the way, why are the Arabs giving us so much trouble lately? We want to go back home. They have enough countries of their own. There's a connection between the two. Arabs giving us a problem, especially before Mashiach comes. An Arab mosque in the holiest of holiest. It will be a sore thumb. Like a sore thumb in our eyes. A thorn to remind us, hey, Look how spiritual they are. Look how holy they are. They really believe in what they believe. They bow down five times. They pray to Hashem. Do you know what kitrug, what accusation, chas v'shalom, that may be for those of us who are not as observant, who are not praying as much? Even though we know the Arabs took everything that they have from us, from Judaism, from the Torah, nevertheless, that building there Their 
war against us is only intended to remind us that the war between Jews and Muslims is a spiritual war. The secular Arabs don't really have anything against us. They'd rather live in peace. They'd rather have a Jewish government. But there's something that the religious fanatics, the Muslims, have against us. They're being used as a whip against us. That mosque in the Harabayt is intended to remind us, you're not doing what's right. You're not busying yourself in thinking about building the Bet HaMikdash. Look at them, they're ahead of you, Hazrat Shalom. And they will not allow us to have peace of mind in Israel if we don't do what is right. If we want to be like the rest of the nations in the world, like the Europeans, they won't tolerate that. That's defiling the Holy Land. They have to remind us that we are defiling our own land. We are defiling the land by allowing women to dress immodestly. Their problem is with Zionism, not with Judaism. Their problem is with the Israeli conduct, the secular conduct of today, of being so arrogant, of we have the best air force and the best army. Well, they did not always succeed in every battle. And the few battles that they did is only because of miracles of Hashem. Do you know what Saddam Hussein said, if you forgot about him already? He's long gone, right? Well, he said he was going to burn up half of Eretz Israel, all of Gush Dan, by throwing the Scud missiles. And he knew what he was talking about. What was going to happen, if he was going to get his way, is when the Scud missile would land at where the gas is distributed in Israel, it would have really caught on fire and tremendous damage would have occurred. But somehow, somehow, in a miraculous way, they had to shut it down because there was a leak before the scud hit. They shut it down, there was a leak. And because they shut it down, nothing happened. The one who got on the radio said uh, he's not religious. But the fact that you're thanking Hashem, the Almighty, for all the miracles, I congratulate you because you're doing the right thing. There was a miracle here. Had it not been for the miracles of Hashem, for Him looking over us, would we be able to survive in the sea of Arabs? No way. It's all a miracle. But unfortunately, the regime today in Israel is not observant. And therefore, their ideas are, it's our might. Well, if it's your might, if that's the, thing you, the way you think, we're going to prove you wrong. And that is why, look what's happening today. We have a bunch of clowns as our leaders who cannot conduct a normal war, a small war against a bunch of terrorists. How, much, how many Hezbollah did, did we have in Lebanon already that fought against the mighty Israeli army? just like to end with another point. I spoke a little bit about Teshuvah. In order to do proper Teshuvah, one needs to learn. If one does not learn, one does not know what he's doing wrong. So part of Teshuvah is learning. Once you learn, it requires Cheshbon nefesh. One needs to contemplate his situation, his life, what he's doing wrong. One needs to ponder his tachlit, his purpose in life. Teshuvah is not something that you just do just like that. You really have to be sincere. You really have to think about what you're doing. And of course, if you're sincere, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will help you. Those who come to seek divine assistance, Hashem will give it to them. No problem whatsoever. But they have to be sincere. How close are we to the very end? Anybody want to guess? How close are we to the very, very end? I don't think many of you are aware. Many of you perhaps have not heard of the Baba Sali. Baba Sali came in a dream to his son, Rabbi Baruch Abu Khatsira, and says, you know what? Do me a favor, take the gold watch that I left 
and give it to Rabbi Mordechai Eliyahu. This happened not too long ago. This watch tells one when Mashiach is coming. How does this watch tell us when Mashiach is coming? When the hands, both hands are at 12 o'clock. When he gave him the golden watch, it was 3.15 in the afternoon. Later on, he sent him a silver watch. What silver? Gold is din, judgment, and silver is rachamim, compassion, mercy. And when he got the watch of mercy, it showed a quarter to 12. Ladies and gentlemen, right now it's showing one minute before 12. And in case you don't believe me, I want you to see the little video. It's an Israeli TV recently. They wanted to be sure that this is a fact and they're not making up a story. בחדר הקטן הזה, בביתו של המקובל, הרב מרדכי אליהו, נמצא השעון המדובר. לפני יותר משנתיים התגלה בחלומו של האבא בברוך, אביו, אבא בסאלי, וביקש ממנו למסור את השעון הזה לרב מרדכי אליהו. בחלום הוא מגלה לבנו שכאשר יגיעו המחוגים לשעה 12, יבוא המשיח. אני נזהר, לא נגוע בשעון. לא פותח את השעון, אני פוחד יותר את השעון, אבל הוא מונח על צבי. בתחילה מסר הבן הרב אליהו את שעון הזהב. אבל כעבור כמה חודשים שוב נגלה אביב בחלום וביקש למסור את שעון הכסף. השעה הייתה אז שלוש, אומרים המקורבים. עכשיו עומדים המחוגים על רבע לשתים עשרה. כיוון שיגיע השעה לשעה כזו וכזו, זה סימן שהגאולה מתחילה. אז הכסף, השעון הזהב הוא נמצא למטה, שעון הכסף נמצא על השעון הזהב, כי כסף זה רחמים, וזהב זה דין. אני רציתי שהרחמים יהיו על הזה. והקדוש ברוך הוא יעזור שהגאולה תהיה מהר. הרב מרדכי אליהו נהג להזכיר בדרישותיו את סיפור השעונים, אבל היום בפעם הראשונה זכינו לצלם אותם. אבל צריכים להאמין שהמשך יבוא, והמעשים הטובים שלנו יבואו יותר מהר. For those of you who didn't understand, he's talking about that the watches show that Mashiach is coming very very soon, and that we obviously need to pray that it should happen soon, ברחמים, that it should be with pity, with compassion, and now with tremendous judgments and wars. Ladies and gentlemen, we are getting very close to Purim, and you know the story of a Purim is uh, difficult to understand, and only later on when things unfold do we realize what was planned. The whole plan of Amman going against the Jews was a design from Hashem to awaken them to do Teshuvah. That was the whole intent. Hashem intended to save them, to protect them, and to foil the plans of our enemies. But He wanted them to do Teshuvah and to bring about their salvation on their own. In the same way, before Mashiach comes, there will be a plan. The script has already been written. It is up to us to read it and to see what is going to happen next. The Zohar, in talking about the end of days, tells us that the reason why the Jews have suffered so much is because of the tears of Esav. He shed tears because he was robbed of his Bechorah. Yaakov took his Bechorah from him, the rights to the firstborn. And he did it not in a very direct or honest way, he, through a trick. So Yitzhak tells Esav, don't worry. Yaakov can only keep the Bechorah and the blessings of the Bechorah if he follows the Torah mitzvot. Otherwise, you will rule over him and not the other way around. The Zohar says, we've been paying a lot for the tears that Esav shed with tears of our own, tears of suffering in the hands of Esav. It is up to us to wipe those tears away the tears of Esav, how? By bringing tears of Teshuvah. That is how we will be able to strengthen and overcome and defeat Esav. 
Bezat Hashem, very soon, all those tears that were shed, the Prophet says, Umacha Hashem dim'am al kol panim, as we tell all mourners when we comfort them, very soon HaKadosh Baruch Hu will wipe our tears. He will wipe our tears of pain with the tears of joy. And all of us, Bezat Hashem, will soon merit to see the fulfillment of the words of the Prophet, Uvao Tzion Berina, we will come celebrating to Tzion, Ki ayin be'ayin yiru, with our own eyes we will see Beshuvah Shen Tzion. Thank you.